The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Would you be surprised if, a few minutes from now, your telephone should ring... Hello? This is the Radio Checking Bureau. Is your radio turned on now? Why, yes, it is. What program are you listening to, please? This is your FBI. Do you know the sponsors of that program? Why, of course I do. It's the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Why, just last week, I got my equitable representative to bring me that fact-facing chart for fathers they tell about on this program. Believe me, that chart is a real eye-opener. So, naturally, I know that This Is Your FBI is sponsored by the Equitable Society. And in just 15 minutes, I'll give all fathers full information about the Equitable Society's fact-facing chart that this father found so valuable. Tonight's FBI file, The Bowtie Murders. Almost every criminal has his favorite place of action. The jewel thief chooses vacation resorts. The bank robber must, of necessity, pick a spot that boasts a place where people deposit money. The car thief loiters near unprotected parking lots. But in the family of criminals, there is one member who needs no specific location for his crime, who has no favorite haunt at which to practice his vicious art. That criminal is the killer. Tonight's file opens in a modest cottage located on a quiet, tree-lined street in a town in Northern California. In the living room of this dwelling, shafts of late afternoon sun pick out the figure of a man seated at a piano. He is playing softly. Pardon me. Yes? I may be intruding, but I'm looking for someone. Well? Uh, Miss Peg Sterling. She used to live here. Oh, she still does. Well, may I ask where she is? She's out. When is she expected back? Soon. My name is Alan Harvey. I've heard of you. Really? You were engaged to Peg at one time, weren't you? That's right. Who are you? I'm George Danbury. I board next door. Oh. You've been away from here for some time, haven't you? Almost two years. Why did you come back? Well, this is my hometown. Only reason for returning? What do you mean? George! Oh, here she is. George, I wonder if you'd mind helping. Oh. Hello, Peg. Alice. Surprise? Yes. How are you, darling? Why, I'm fine. When did you get to town? Well, a few hours ago. I'm staying at the Central Hotel. As soon as I checked in there, I hurried right over here. I see. Well, aren't you glad to see me? Oh, of course I am. Will you please excuse me? <gasps> I imagine you two would prefer to be alone. What's the matter, Major? You restless? <laughs> you want to go out? <laughs> okay, honey. One short run before dinner. Hello, Peg. Oh, George, you startled me. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just coming in to see you. May I come in? Yes. Come ahead. 
Peg, I... I want to apologize for walking out as I did. Well, it was rather peculiar. <laughs> I realize that. It was just that... Well, his coming back upset me terribly. Why? You didn't even know, Alan. I know that you were once engaged. Well, that was a long time ago. Only two years. That's still a long time. Not if you were in love. You did love him, didn't you? Yes. Well, that isn't easily forgotten. Please, George. Where is he now, Peg? He went back to his hotel. Did he tell him? About us? What do you mean? That you're now engaged to me. No, I didn't. Oh, Peg, why not? Well, it was all so casual. I didn't have a chance. Please, let's not talk about it now. Oh, Peg, we must. There's something I have to know. Yes, George? Does his coming back make a difference with us? Does it, Peg? I don't know, George. I don't know. Some 50-odd miles away from the little California town, the San Francisco field office of the FBI, Special Agent Jim Taylor has a problem, too. Oh, Jim. Oh, oh hello, Paul. Are you looking for me? Yes, you're going to have to count me out of that bowling match tonight. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Jim. Taking a trip to Fresno. Well, what's up? Well, I heard about an unsolved murder down there. Made me sufficiently curious to call the local police and get the details. Yes? From what they told me, it sounds like another job by the Bowtie Murderer. Bowtie Murderer? Mm-hmm. That's right. Well, that's a pretty lurid title. How did he get it? By strangling his victim with a rope, then tying the knot in a neat bow. Oh, I see. Don't you remember him in that Indian reservation case? Uh, no. Oh, I guess that was before I transferred to this office. Oh, yeah, that's right. What are the details? Well, about 11 months ago, a woman's body was found on an Indian reservation on the outskirts of Yosemite Park. She'd been strangled in the manner that I just described. It. Yes? There were no witnesses to the killing. In fact, the body wasn't found until a week later... We learned that she and a man had been on a camping trip. A honeymoon, as a matter of fact. Well, how'd you learn that? From the girl's parents, after we had identified the body. Well, could they give you anything on the man? No, she didn't live at home. She'd just written to her parents, telling them about the marriage and the proposed trip. Oh. Any clues at the scene of the crime? Just one. A set of tire tracks that was made by what was obviously his car. Well, did they lead to anything? No. No, we just have them on file. And nothing ever turned up on the man? Not a thing, Paul. He disappeared without a trace. Well, Jim, this, this killing in Fresno, did the police pick up the murderer? No, he got the jump on them, too. But you do think it's the same man? Well, I'll be able to answer that one better, Paul, when I get back from Fresno. What's the matter, boy? Major! Hey! Oh, Peg. Oh, that's you, Alan? Yes. I'm back here in the garden. Oh. Oh, now, Major, stop that. It's Alan. <laughs> you remember Alan? Well, hello there, fella. Oh, 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 Don't jump boy. all over and down, boy. Down. <laughs> down, boy. Quiet. <laughs> oh, that's better. <laughs> you care to share a swing? Love to. Oh. Beautiful night, isn't it? Lovely. Hope you don't mind me dropping around. Well, of course not, Alan. It's good to be back. You know, Alan, you still haven't told me where you've been. Oh. Well, I won't bore you with a play-by-play. I've been in Europe, mostly, working for the government. How exciting. It's still good to be back. Peg. Yes? I want you to know something. I was a fool to ever leave here. Please, let's not talk about the past. But I want to. That silly fight we had. My walking out was the biggest mistake I ever made. Alan, that's all forgotten. I'm completely over it. That's what I was afraid of. What do you mean? There's someone else, isn't there? Well... That man who was playing the piano this afternoon. Yes. Serious? We're engaged. Who is he? His name is George Danbury. He boards next door. How long have you been on him? He moved in about ten months ago. He came here for his health. Where's he from? The East. What's his background? He's a musician. Where's he work? He gives concerts. He just returned from a tour yesterday. Oh, 
Why all the questions? You're engaged to the man. I want to know something about him. Alan, he's the sweetest person I've ever known. Well, thanks. Darling, you weren't exactly sweet. Look, what has sweetness got to do with being in love? We were in love. You'll admit that, won't you? Alan, let's not start to fight again. I'm sorry. Peg, are you going to marry the guy? Yes. Hello there, Paul. Oh, well, welcome back, Jim. How was Fresno? I've got quite a story. Well, let's have it. Well, first of all, I've definitely established that both murders were committed by the same man. Well, how'd you do it? With those tire tracks we found on the Indian reservation. But, unfortunately, I didn't come up with a killer. Well, what's the story on the second murder? Well, more or less the same pattern as on the first one. The victim and her newly married husband went on a cabining trip outside of Fresno. She was strangled. Bow tie knot. Her body was found several days later. Was the victim identified? Yes, she came from Los Angeles. Lived alone, met this man, married him shortly afterward, went on the trip. Well, how'd you find that out? Well, she wrote to an aunt in San Diego, gave her the details. Well, how about the girl's friends? Could they give a description of the man? No, she kept pretty much to herself. The Los Angeles police are checking, but so far they haven't gotten anything. How about a motive for these killings, Jim? There just doesn't seem to be any. What? No. Neither of the victims had any money. Well, you think he just wantonly killed them? I'm afraid so, yes. Paul, I believe we're dealing with some sort of homicidal maniac. And they're usually the most elusive and cunning of all killers. I know. Jim, tell me some more about those tire tracks. Oh, yes. Well, the Fresno police found an old tire that had been discarded near the camping site. Yes? They took an impression of the treads and compared them with the tire markings that we had found at the reservation. They were identical. This was a tire the killer had thrown away. Apparently, yes. And, Paul, it can be our first good lead. I've already contacted the company that made the tire, gave them the number on it. They'll look up the dealer was sold to and then contact me here. I didn't hear you come in, Mr. Harvey. The door was open. Where's Peg? She went out to the garage. I suppose I should congratulate you. What for? Peg told me last night that she's going to marry you. That's right. You're a lucky guy. Thank you. Danbury. Yes? Peg tells me that you're a concert pianist. Yes. From the east? I am. Where? New York. What brought you out here? He'll help. You've just been on a tour? That's correct. Where'd you play? All through California. Specifically where? Uh, Harvey, why all these questions? I have a right to know something about you. You have a right? Yes. How? Peg is very dear to me. But I happen to be the one who's married. That's why I want to know about you. You've told Peg little or nothing about your past. Harvey, it's none of your business. I'm making it my business. You're not going to marry Peg. That was Peg. Yes. She's out back. I know. Peg. Peg. George. Back here in the garden. Yeah, I see her. George, come here quick. Oh, darling. Darling, what is it? Peg, what's wrong? Oh, Alice. Look, both of you. It's your dog. Major. Yes. This cord around his neck. He was strangled to death. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI promotes security for the nation. Now, a word to fathers about security for the family. Father, tonight I'm going to ask you to pull up that curtain. I mean the iron curtain that many fathers erect themselves so that they won't have to face facts vital to their family's future. Pull up that curtain right now and ask yourself this question. If I should die, how would my family get through the critical years before our youngest child finished high school? 
How long would my wife and children continue to be well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed? Please don't say to yourself, oh, I guess they'd get along all right. That's pulling down the curtain again. What you're after is a true and honest answer. To help you get it, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has prepared a special fact-facing chart which has these three advantages. First, it's simplicity itself. You can fill it out in five minutes flat. Second, you are guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures which illustrate the unavoidable expenses your family will have to meet. Third, when you're finished with this fact-facing chart, you'll have a clear, accurate, and complete picture of just what income your family would need during the critical years. Okay, Mr. Cross, I've raised that curtain. Tell me where to get this fact-facing chart, and how much does it cost? Why, it doesn't cost a cent. The Equitable Society representative in your community will be glad to bring you this fact-facing chart. Phone him tomorrow, or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, The Bowtie Murders. In almost every case in which your FBI finds itself involved, time is the important element. In tonight's case, time assumes a double importance. For when your FBI realizes that it is dealing with a homicidal maniac, a killer who may strike anywhere at any hour, then the race against time really becomes a race against death. The job then resolves itself into two questions, the first of which is whether or not your FBI can catch the killer. That is important. But even more important is the second question, which is, can your FBI make the arrest in time before the maniac strikes again? Tonight's file continues at the San Francisco field office of the FBI. Special Agent Jim Taylor is just approaching his desk. Jim. Oh, yes, Paul. I've been looking for you. I've been out working. Well, this teletype came in about an hour ago from the Los Angeles police. Mm -hmm. It's a description of the missing killer. May I see it, please? Sure, here you are. Thanks, Paul. Now, they interviewed several people who were casual acquaintances of the victim. Yes, I see that. Killer used the name of Thomas Wilson. Oh, probably an alias. Mm -hmm. About six feet tall, blonde hair, 30 to 35 years old. Educated speech wears horn-rimmed glasses. Well, I've already sent out an alarm on him from here. Oh, good. Now, how'd you make out with the tire company? Well, it's turned out to be sort of a tinkers to evers to chance. Oh, what happened? Well, I went to see the tire dealer. He's over in Oakland. Yes? According to his records, that tire was sold three years ago to a man named John Randolph. Well, did you get Randolph's address? Yes. He lives right here in San Francisco. I've already seen him. And? And he's not the man we're looking for. He sold the car the tire was on two and a half years ago to a used car dealer named... Named Wharton. It was a 1940 Chevrolet Coupe. Well, where is this Wharton? Well, he was right here in town, but he went out of business. Oh, fine. No, no, it's not as bad as it sounds. I've just come from police headquarters, and they helped me check Wharton's present whereabouts. Well, any luck? Yes, he still lives here. I've got an address on him. Good. He hasn't a phone, however, so in order to find out how he disposed of that car, I'm going to have to go out and see him. In fact, I'm on my way right now. <laughs> Am I intruding, Peg? Oh, of course not, George. Well, I, I thought you might want to be alone. No. I know how badly you must feel about last night. It was awful. Why would anyone do such a thing, George? Why? I can't imagine. Poor Major. Peg. Yes, dear? Uh, there's something I want to talk to you about. What is it? A conversation I had last night with Alan, just before you... Uh, you found Major. Yes? Well, he insisted upon questioning me about who I was, where I came from, what I did. What? He said he had a right to know. 
darling, that's ridiculous. Peg, does he have that right? Well, of course not. Why, why, I actually know less about him than I do about you. But I thought when your mother was alive, he boarded here at your house. He did. But he lived with us less than six months. Then he went away. Could I ask a great favor of you, Peg? What, darling? Would you mind not seeing him anymore? Well, I have one reservation. What? He called this morning. He said he was going away. Oh, yeah? He asked if I'd see him this afternoon before he goes. Do you mind terribly if I do? No. <laughs> You're a darling. Uh, but I have one reservation. What? That we get married before another old boat turns up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, darling. No, I mean soon. Tomorrow. All right, tomorrow. Oh, that's <laughs> wonderful. And, darling, you know I have our honeymoon all planned. Where are we going? On a camping trip. Special Agent Palmer. Hello, Paul. Jim Taylor. Oh, hello, Jim. Did you contact that used car dealer? Yes. How'd you make out? Well, I spent most of the morning with him going over his old record. Yes? We finally came across the name of the man who purchased the Chevrolet Coupe from him. Good. The uh, purchaser lives upstate about 50 miles, though. Of course, he may have sold the car, too, but anyway, I'm going to run up to see him. Well, did you get the motor number of the car? Yes. I sent it over to the license bureau to have them check it to see who the present owner is, but that'll all take time. But meanwhile, I'm going to drive upstate. <laughs> Can I help you, sir? Oh, yes. Yes, I'm looking for a man named Alan Harvey. I believe he lives here. Well, he used to board here. He moved out two years ago. Oh. Uh, did you know him? I just met him the other day. You mean he's still around town? Well, he's leaving today. Do you know where I could find him? Well, he's gone out for a ride with my fiance, the girl who lives in this house. Oh. Well, my name is Taylor. Oh, how do you do, sir? I'm George Danbury. How do you do? I'm a special agent of the FBI, Mr. Danbury. Here are my credentials. I see. I wonder if you could describe this Alan Harvey for me, please. Well, I'll try. He's about six feet tall, has blonde hair. And about how old? Around 35. Does he wear horn rim glasses? Yes, he does. And does he by any chance drive a Chevrolet coupe? Yes. Well, from your description, Mr. Danbury, he could be the man I'm looking for. On what charge? Murder. Murder? Yes. The man I'm seeking killed two women, both times using the same technique. He strangled them with a cord that he tied with a special knot. Oh, wait a minute. Sort of a bow? Yes. Why? Well, my fiancé's dog was killed that way last night. While this man Harvey was around? Yes. And you say that she's out with him now? Yes. Where did they go? Well, uh, Peg said something about going out to Stony Point. That's a picnic ground. When did they leave? Over an hour ago. You know how to get there? Yes. How far is it? About ten miles. We'd better get going at once. <laughs> There's a storm coming up. Mm hmm. Don't you think we'd better be starting back? No, please. But look at those clouds. Peg, this is our last afternoon together. I'd like to stay here and watch the storm. We'll get soaked. Not if we get in the car. Come on. Okay. You're not worried about what your boyfriend will say, are you? Of course not. George knows I came out here with you. Did he give you permission? Alan, please. Go ahead, dear. Oh, thank you. We got in just in time. Look, it's starting to rain. Uh-huh. Beautiful, isn't it? The rain? The storm. Ever since I was a kid, I've always loved to watch one. The massive black clouds. Jagged streaks of lightning searing the sky. Hey, doesn't it excite you? Well, not exactly. I... I sort of get scared. Listen to that thunder gets inside of me. It, it fills me with its power. Alan, 
Can't you feel it too, Peg? Look, I think we should go home. No. Alan, I don't like this. You're not going home. Now, just a minute. You're not going back to him, Peg. Alan, please. You're staying here. What are you doing? Let go of me. No. No. Alan, you're choking. Alan. Let go of her. You... Oh, 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 Peg. Oh, thank heaven. Peggy, are you all right? Yes. Danbury, put her in your car. Yes, sir. Well, I think we can safely say that Mr. Harvey's career of murder is ended. Alan Harvey was tried on the charge of murder. Because of his mental condition, he was sentenced to life imprisonment in a federal institution for the mentally deficient. Your FBI succeeded in closing this case in its files because of one rule, which J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, long ago laid down. That rule, which is indelibly impressed upon every special agent when he goes through his course of training, is that no clue is too small to follow. Now, this case tonight is an excellent illustration of that point. For your FBI had only the factory number on the carcass of a discarded tire. But from that single clue, a killer was captured. Thus, once more, was your FBI able to serve in protecting you, the American people. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. When the breadwinner of a family dies, what are the critical years for his wife and children? The critical years are the years before the youngest child finishes high school, years in which the home must be kept together. To help you estimate just what income your family would need during those critical years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has prepared a special fact-facing chart for fathers. Your Equitable Society representative will be glad to bring you a copy of this fact-facing chart. Phone him tomorrow or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Baby Big Shot. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI. is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Baby Big Shot, on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.